We begin tonight with breaking news. The Bear County Sheriff's Office investigating what they're calling a murder suicide. Lee Waldman is live at the Esperanza apartment complex on Petranco Road with the very latest. Lee, we understand as all this was taking place, there was a baby in that apartment. Yeah, Sheriff Salazar tells us a baby girl around six or seven months old was actually sitting in a high chair watching cartoons when his deputies arrived on scene here. It all happened inside of one of the apartments here at the Esperanza Apartments. It's off of Petranco Road. This is on the far west side. I believe we have some video we can show you from inside of the apartment complex um, showing that large scene. Sheriff Salazar says this was a murder-suicide. Both victims, both the victim and the suspect are in their 30s. A man called 911 saying he had just killed a woman deputies got here extremely fast and the man actually unlocked the door for them to come inside deputies say they saw the man holding a large military style knife a woman's body was behind him and what the sheriff called one of the worst scenes he had ever seen a baby girl like i mentioned just sitting there watching cartoons in her high chair the man allowed a deputy to go inside and grab that little girl take her out safely she was completely unharmed the man then started to stab himself a deputy tried to use a taser, but it did not work. Now, the deputies then tried to save that man, but they were unable to. The sheriff complimenting his team today, saying they handled a very hard situation as best as they could. He also took time to compliment dispatchers handling of this situation. Our dispatcher did a great job of getting deputies dispatched while simultaneously keeping the suspect on the phone, trying to talk him down, knowing full well what he had already uh, communicated to her. Deputies happened to be right across the street and made the call within about three minutes. Now, he said the deputies got here extremely quickly. He complimented that several times, saying the dispatcher did handle this situation as best as they could. We do have several questions this evening. We're trying to get answered. We don't know the exact relationship between that couple. The sheriff said he had not gotten any domestic violence calls to this particular apartment before. We also know that that couple was not the couple listed on the lease here. He's not sure if it's some kind of subleasing agreement. That little girl with CPS tonight, they're hopefully trying to reunite her with some other family members. Her relationship to the couple also unknown at this point. Now, Sheriff Sal told us the five deputies who responded in this situation, they're all going to be on administrative leave for the next five days. That's typical in a situation like this. He called this a custodial death situation. Now, we know that they're going to be meeting with the sheriff's office psychologist to debrief and decompress after what they saw. He said one of their deputies taking this situation extremely hard, seeing this violent act on play right in front of them. On the far west side, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Lee. We're continuing to follow more breaking news. San Antonio police investigating a shooting in the 4000 block of East South Cross. Officers say it happened about 430 this afternoon. We're told a woman in her 50s shot in the leg here. Police say witnesses heard the victim and an unknown man arguing that after that they heard a gunshot. The woman was taken to Samsi where she is expected to be OK. There are no suspects at this time. A state of disaster. That is the situation today in Guadalupe County after that tornado ripped through a rural area just northeast of Seguin in the town of Kingsbury. Yeah, according to the county judge Kyle Kucher, more than 20 properties severely impacted seven families now displaced. Alicia Barrera is in Guadalupe County where damage assessment is underway. Snap tree trunks. You've got 100 plus year old oak trees cracked in half debris in and wrapped around branches homes severely damaged we've got roofs ripped off we've got homes knocked off foundations it's the perfect storm in the rural kingsbury area that resulted in a state of disaster declaration we have been in communication with the national weather service they have reported they believe that was tornadic activity that took place and touchdowns. This morning, Guadalupe County Judge Kyle Kutcher signed the request for additional state help after seeing the destruction left behind by last night's storms. When you have displaced residents, that's the most um, most pressing issue. Thank God that we didn't have any serious injuries or fatalities reported. So we'll do everything we can as the county to support those families. The county's Office of Emergency Management continues to survey the affected area to help the families without insurance. Right now, the damage is probably in the five mile estimation. 
until we get a track from the weather service to get exactly how big that is. That area out there is still out of power. So the county's currently working on getting them some additional water uh, supplies that they need. It could be as early as this afternoon that county officials received that official report from the National Weather Service, which would include the category of the tornado. Meanwhile, damage assessments, those will continue and could take several weeks to complete. In Seguin, Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. Part of assessing that damage, Guadalupe County Emergency Management asking that all damage reports from that storm be emailed in. You can make those reports by sending an email to emc at co.guadalupe.tx.us. The report must include the name of the homeowner, the address that's affected, a phone number, insurance information, description and estimate of the damage. Also in Kingsbury, northeast of Seguin, we spoke with one man who had his home and his RV destroyed by this storm. He tells us he wasn't home at the time, but his 70 year old father, who is immobile, was. Now, miraculously, his father was not hurt in any of this, but now he is left picking up whatever is left behind of his home from that storm, trying to stay as positive as he can. It's tough, you know. Hmm. When you've had a rough beginning, <laughs> you smooth it out, and then it, it's just like, as soon as you get hit, it's bam, they knock you down, and something knocks you down. All you gotta do is you just gotta keep getting up. Murphy says that while his house was destroyed, what was stored in his shed was somehow untouched. The shed itself, though, was blown into the home. Yeah, he also said his dad had part of the roof collapse on him, then it was blown off him and somehow not injured in any of that. Somehow not injured in any of that. Meanwhile, a much calmer day today so far. Beautiful Tuesday, really, Adam. Yeah, gorgeous day today, and you know, it's what we get often after those severe weather days. We get a lot of sunshine, and that's what we have today. Now, we did just get the preliminary report from the National Weather Service regarding that tornado we were just talking about. So you see Seguin on the left side of the screen there, Kingsbury just northeast of it, and then Stairtown right over the San Marcos River into Caldwell County. And the preliminary information is a high-end EF1 tornado. There's the chance that as they go through more information and data and damage assessment, they could rate it and change it to a low-end EF2. Otherwise, right now, high-end EF1, seven-point mile 7.5 mile track from Kingsbury to Stairtown. It was on the ground for about 20 minutes. That's the latest on that. Get ready for a unseasonably cool night. We're gonna get into how cold and where in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. Let's check out traffic right now. This is Highway 90 at Couples, and we're seeing a lot of traffic, but it's moving very smoothly. Again, this is Highway 90 at Couples. The fatal shooting of a man at the hands of deputies was caught on camera, but it's that man's hands at the center of this case. Gilbert Flores was killed by deputies back in 2015. Flores hands appeared to be up in the air right before he was shot. And now a federal civil trial is underway after a lawsuit was filed against two Bear County deputies involved. Our cameras not allowed in the courtroom today, but Erica Hernandez shares the testimony from one of those deputies. It was a controversial video that case at 12 obtained in 2015. Gilbert Flores was recorded in a 12 minute confrontation outside his northwest side home in August 2015. The video shows the moments Flores was killed after being shot by deputies Greg Vasquez and Robert Sanchez, and it appears he was surrendering as his hands were in the air. Flores's widow and family filed a lawsuit shortly after. The first deputy on the scene was Greg Vasquez. He was on the stand today and was questioned about the moments leading up to him firing the first shot. Vasquez explained that he had tried several times to de-escalate the situation, even after he says Flores had lunged at him with the knife, taken his taser gun and started looking into his patrol unit. But lawyers for the family pushed on the fact that Flores had his hands up for about three seconds and wasn't lunging at him when he fired the shot. He said on the stand, quote, he's still a threat until he drops the knife, end quote. Later, a forensic video analyst would also testify that after examining the video frame by frame, that Flores' hands, the knife he was holding, and his feet were not moving at the time shots were fired. Two videos shot by witnesses are key evidence for the family in this case.
No specific dollar amount was listed on this lawsuit, but the family is seeking compensation for damages such as for Flotus's funeral expenses as well as mental anguish. At the federal courthouse, Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. Seized vehicles and cash at the center of a Texas Rangers investigation into Real County Sheriff. Four search warrants released to the KSAT 12 defenders show Rangers raided four properties last December associated with Sheriff Nathan Johnson's office. The items that were targeted include vehicle impoundment inventory sheets, currency seizure paperwork, as well as body cam and dashboard video dating back to April of 2017. That's the same month that Sheriff Johnson was first appointed sheriff. Johnson confirmed the investigation in a phone call today and that some items were seized from his office. He said he has not been provided an update on the status of the investigation. The American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA, put $327 million into the city of San Antonio's pockets for it to dole out and help with recovery from the pandemic. After covering some budget shortfalls and then helping people pay overdue utility bills, the city council decided last month on some broad strokes of how to spend the rest of that money. Now that included tacking on some leftover dollars from a previous program as well. But the details aren't done yet, though City Hall reporter Garrett Berger tells us there are plenty of groups who are waiting anxiously. Dressed in purple, small businesses supporting the nonprofit group San Antonio for Growth on the East Side, or SAGE, crowded into the front rows of city council chambers. Sometimes uh, more is said in silence than, than it is in an overt statement. SAGE is focused on growing the East Side economy, specifically for small business. Its president and CEO says it's eager to make use of ARPA dollars. I was impatient before ARPA was even a thing. I was impatient when COVID, before COVID. Our communities are so far behind that there is no time to wait, think, and, and, and come up with another plan, another study. The city got $327 million through ARPA, but councils focus now on less than $88 million, which it has already divvied up into buckets for areas like arts, seniors, youth, mental health and small business. It's our big shot at transformational change. We have to get this right. Council subcommittees, though, need to figure out how exactly they'll put the money to use in those areas. The ARPA money's definitely not chump change, but there's still only so much to be snatched up. But scarcity, I think, is an important word that we need to add to our vocabulary as we move forward on this one. Many groups have tried to get a jump on it, sending the city hundreds of millions of dollars worth of unsolicited requests. CAUSA, which represents local arts organizations, wants the five million that's set aside for art to be split four to one between arts agencies and individual artists. And they're hoping the city puts it out quickly, not over multiple years. It's not for the future. It's about recovering from this last two years of our pandemic. City officials have pointed out the county also has federal dollars available. While it's not yet looking for any proposals, staff say interested groups should stay engaged in the process. We are going to, to be involved in this process until it's completed. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Still to come here at 6, the Alamo City preparing for college hoops as March Madness in full swing now. Coming up, we take a look at how this could be a huge boost to local businesses. Should be a big weekend. Oh yeah, big names. I'm Billy Collier in Lacoste. Coming up, calls for more police action after a pair of 12-year-old boys were shot at as they walked home from the bus stop. That's on the night beat. The cost of car and home insurance is going up. We're going to tell you why that is and how to save a few bucks on the night beat. If thousands of college hoops fans will be in the Alamo City this week for the men's NCAA tournament. San Antonio once again hosting part of the tourney and there's some pretty high profile teams coming to town. Some big names in basketball. RJ Marquez tells us what this not only means for the games themselves, but local businesses and hotels off the court. March Madness is back in San Antonio and along with it, a sense of normalcy. This tournament feels normal again. We've got fans in the stands. They, the AT&T Center will be rocking on Thursday. This week, the AT&T Center is hosting the Men's South Regional with Arizona, Houston, Michigan, and Villanova vying for a Final Four spot. A great lineup of four teams from um, a number one seed to 
two teams that played in the men's Final Four championship game uh, back in 2018 with Villanova and Michigan. San Antonio is no stranger to hosting NCAA tournament games. Last year, the city hosted the women's tournament but had COVID protocols in place and limited fan capacity. That's not the case this year. No COVID protocols to be aware of. Recognize that caution, you know, err on the side of caution, sure, but whatever you're comfortable with, come on in and enjoy some great basketball. And even though this regional is being held at the AT&T Center, it'll still mean big money for these downtown businesses. Many restaurants and hotels will be filled with fans and also the teams will be staying right here in the heart of downtown San Antonio. We anticipate about $10 million of economic impact in uh, visitor spending and probably 15,000 plus hotel room nights that are you know, fulfilled in downtown San Antonio. And as teams and fans arrive in the Alamo City this week, Jenny Carnes and the local organizing committee are expecting big wins on the court and off it. We're used to doing the Final Fours at the Alamo Dome, but it, it'll be nice to be in a, a more intimate setting um, for a sellout crowd, hopefully, on Thursday. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Oh, yeah. It's that time again <laughs> happening tomorrow. We'll be giving away our 2022 KSAT Weather Authority Fiesta medals. The giveaway will be at the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. The line will begin at 4. The medals will be given away at 6. The medals are available while supplies last. All day today, there's been a Fiesta vibe around here. We're yeah. getting things ready. Are you, that, that looks like a Fiesta ready face. It are is. You, you're going to be out there tomorrow, right? <laughs> yeah, I'll be giving them away. Yeah. And we were originally going to have my Thermometer Thursday medals, but there's this little thing called the supply chain that we've <laughs> yeah. had some issues with yeah. lately and we're running into problems. But I do have many of last year's medals that we'll be giving away there as well. And as usual, I'll have a thermometer that will be uh, doing a raffle drawing for, you know, a drawing for. So head out there tomorrow. It's on Terra Boulevard, I believe in Stone Oak. And all right, well, you can go to social media for all those details, but we have to get to the forecast here. This evening, temperatures falling off quickly. I don't want the temperature to really catch you off guard tomorrow morning, so let's talk about it. We'll be down in the mid 50s by 10 o'clock, and tomorrow morning, you're going to feel a chill in the air. All right, take a look at the readings across the state. And remember, the wind is coming out of North Texas right now, where it's only in the 50s. Lubbock 51, Dallas 50, Abilene 54. Meanwhile, Del Rio at 67. Currently in San Antonio, we're at 65 degrees and into the 70s farther south of town. As we go through the evening, temperatures are going to fall off pretty quickly and it's going to be unseasonably cool tomorrow morning. We're expecting some upper 30s in parts of Bear County. I mean, Holotus 38, you even get into Bernie 39, Bulverde 39, Smithson Valley about 39, Comfort 36, Bandera Pipe Creek 36. You get the idea, chill in the air tomorrow. We're gonna be about 10 to 15 degrees below average for this time of year. We're thinking San Antonio about 40 in the morning. So long sleeves are a light jacket to start the day and then a comfortable afternoon. But this is gonna be the case every morning the rest of this work week. I mean, Thursday, right near 40 again. By Friday, 43 degrees. And then this weekend, we see a little uptick, a noticeable change in those morning temperatures closer to 50. So despite the cool morning, we'll have a comfortable afternoon tomorrow, right near 70, a lot of sunshine, but you'll notice the wind again. We just can't shake free from that gusty northwesterly wind. It's gonna be in play the next couple of days. So from the upper 30s in the morning in Holotus to 68 in the afternoon. Elmendorf about 71, along with Lavernia and Hondo 73. So cool mornings, comfortable afternoons. That'll be the case all the way through Friday. So the rest of this work week. Here's the big picture of that storm system that affected us yesterday. And right now the severe weather has been moving through Louisiana, parts of Mississippi, Alabama as well, continues to trek eastward. But that's just part of this big system. I mean, this stretches from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up into Canada. Severe weather on the south end in the Gulf states and obviously Texas with some tornadic activity yesterday and heavy snow up on the north cold side of this in northern Minnesota. Over a foot expected in parts of northern Minnesota. Late or late season snowstorm they're having up there with this system. So kind of a classic spring system where a little of everything uh, spanning the nation from it. But Upper level high, that's going to be settling in this ridge, that bump in the upper level flow, big, big blue H, not necessarily a 
heat high, but something noticeable. And we did notice from the storms last night that we woke up to some dirty, muddy cars this morning. It's because of the dust from Mexico got sucked into some of those showers and storms last night. And where we got rain, it dropped some of that dirt and led to that muddy look to some vehicles uh, earlier this morning. So that's why we had that. Otherwise, nothing but sunshine. So good car washing weather the rest of this week through the weekend. Comfortable or cool mornings, then comfortable afternoons. We'll be in the mid 80s by Friday. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, meanwhile, the UTSA football team continues spring ball. Greg. This had to be a fun day to be outside practicing. Yeah. Unlike fall workouts where it's just sizzling. When we come back, we'll talk more about that and about the void they're having to fill on that offensive line for the Roadrunners and DeJounte's version of that last basket against Golden State when we come back. Kids had great energy. It was a pretty day, a little windy, but it was, it was a nice day out there. The UTSA Roadrunners could not have picked a better day to return to spring workouts and big board sports. After enjoying a spring break, the UTSA Roadrunners returned to spring workouts today on campus, knowing the expectations of this team are now much higher than ever before. It's after they scored their most wins in school history with 12 last season, brought home the conference USA Trophy for the first time, now with a potential move to the American Athletic Conference and the big pay raise afforded third-year head coach Jeff Trailer in anticipation of that move for a total of $28 million through 2031. One of the biggest voids the Roadrunners have to fill is that left tackle after Spencer Burford decided to turn pro. One of those competing for that spot is Ernesto Amarez. We're still working out some tweaks at left tackle, brand new position, and uh, you know I'm excited to bring a, a new aspect to the team. You know it's not fair to ask anybody to go in there and just to be Spencer from day one. We, we've all got to be better, you know, from from every one of us, from the head coach to the play caller to the other guys back. All of us have got to be a little bit better to, to help that spot. That's a tough spot to go in there and play instantly. The UTSA Roadrunners Fiesta Spring Game will be held on April the 14th at 7 p.m. at Dub Ferris Stadium. Our San Antonio Spurs have made it to Portland where they'll face the Blazers tomorrow night with a chance to put some distance between them and Portland in the Washington Conference standings and make up some ground against the Pelicans who have now dropped to the 10th and final play in position in the West. The Spurs opened up their four-game road trip with a win against the Warriors on Sunday, 110-108. to That came down to a last-second basket by Keldon Johnson off from this free throw by Yaka Pertle to win the game. Josh Richardson gave us his version of being waved off by DeJounte Murray to crash the boards in case of a miss. Now, following a rare road practice in San Francisco on Monday, DeJounte gave us his version of overruling Josh's plans. He's like, DJ, get back. I'm going to crash. And I was like, no, you get back. I'm going to crash. I mean, obviously, I didn't know the ball was going to, you know, come right there. Uh, didn't even know Yako was going to miss it. I believe he was going to make it, first of all. But he missed it and it happened to, you know, I win. And just try to get my ball, my hand on the ball and hit it or grab it, whatever. And it came in our favor. And he did just that, got his hand on the ball. Next up, Portland. That'll be tomorrow night at 9 p.m. The New Orleans Pelicans have dropped back to down to 10th play in position in the Western Conference following their narrow loss to the Hornets in Charlotte last night. As after the Pelicans jumped out to an early lead in the first half thanks to 27 points from C.J. McCollum. But a poor four-quarter doomed the Pelicans where the Hornets stung them. 28 to 19 in that final period, led by LaMelo Ball, who scored 17, including the game-winning basket with a floater in the lane in the 106 to 103 victory. Consequently, combine that with a Lakers win in Cleveland last night, and Los Angeles moves up to the ninth playing position ahead of the Pelicans back home in Cleveland. LeBron James brought the Lake Show to town, including his 105th career triple double and his sixth of the season, with 38 points to go along with his 12 assists and 10 rebounds in the 131 to 120 victory. So here, are the latest Western Conference. Standings. The top eight, remember, are in right now. Phoenix at number one, followed by Memphis, Golden State, and Utah. You see how far Phoenix is ahead of everybody. Now, the second half of that top eight includes Dallas at number five, followed by Denver, Minnesota, and the Clippers, Los Angeles Clippers. Now, take a look at the guys trying to get in. That includes the Spurs. The Lakers have dropped to ninth. New Orleans is now at 10th. I should say the Lakers moved up to ninth. New Orleans drops to 10th. Spurs at 11, and Portland, as you can see, just a half game behind the Spurs. So that's why tomorrow night's game against Portland is critical. <laughs> just win. Yeah, win. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. We'll be right back. Welcome back. American businesses on high alert as fears mount of a Russian cyber attack hitting the U.S. Meanwhile, the fight in Ukraine rages on. Chris Wynn with the latest update. 
Ukraine on the offense after regaining control of Makariv, threatening Russian resupply as well as efforts to circle the city. But as the Ukrainian counterattack appears to make some headway... U.S. officials now believe Russian President Vladimir Putin's next escalation could be a direct cyber attack on the United States. We are constantly monitoring our own critical infrastructure here at the Pentagon and throughout the U.S. government to make sure that we can remain resilient uh, against a cyber attack. An urgent warning to American businesses to strengthen their cyber defenses immediately. The president has been very clear. If we're attacked in cyberspace, uh, there will be consequences for that. The Biden administration says the private sector can guard against cyber attacks by using multi-factor authentication and changing passwords across networks. The alert comes as Russia continues its assault. In the moment and uh, each day Mariupol is destroyed more and more uh, till now in our estimation about 90 percent of our infrastructure is damaged and destroyed. The southeastern port city of Mariupol once home to more than 450,000 people now reduced to rubble. Families fleeing for their lives unsure of where to go. I'm 84 and this was the first time in my life when I felt horror. I couldn't believe it happened. It was just a shock. In Washington, I'm Chris Wynn reporting. Taking a look at headlines around America now, Jen Psaki has tested positive for COVID-19 again. News of the White House press secretary's positive diagnosis comes just hours before President Joe Biden scheduled to leave for his trip to Brussels and Warsaw. She last tested positive back in October before another foreign trip. The White House has not commented. Disney is opposing Florida's parental rights and education bill, saying on Instagram that it opposes any legislation that infringes on basic human rights. This is the bill dubbed Don't Say Gay by its critics. Florida's Senate passed the bill earlier this month, and Governor Ron DeSantis is expected to sign it into law. It would ban classroom instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity before fourth grade. Disney also saying today it stands in solidarity and support with their LGBTQIA cast, crew, guests and fans. Supreme Court nominee Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson facing hours of intense questioning from senators today during the second day of her historic confirmation hearing. Her judicial philosophy as well as her record as a public defender, the main focus for committee Republicans. Gloria Pasmino has the latest. Judicial philosophy and a focus on her record as a public defender. It was all part of an intense day of questioning for President Joe Biden's Supreme Court nominee, Katanji Brown Jackson. When I get a case, I ensure that I am proceeding from a position of neutrality. Jackson responded to criticism from Senate Republicans that she had so far been vague about her judicial philosophy. It's very important that judges rule without fear or favor. Republicans focused on some of her work as a federal public defender. Now let's talk about being a public defender. Did you consider that rewarding? Senator, yes, um, I did, because public service is very important to me. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham was critical of the process so far, and he suggested there is a double standard when it comes to confirmation hearings. If you're an African-American conservative woman, you're fair game to have your life turned upside down. If you express your faith as a conservative, all of a sudden you're an effing nut, and we're tired of it. Judge Brown is expected back on the Hill Wednesday for a second day of questioning. I'm Gloria Pasmino reporting. As COVID-19 cases rise in Europe, U.S. top health officials expecting cases to increase here as well. The jump in cases in the U.K. is being driven by the Omicron BA2 subvariant. Dr. Anthony Fauci says the U.S. will likely see an uptick in cases, but he says it won't be a surge. While the BA2 variant is more contagious than the original Omicron variant, it doesn't seem to cause as many hospitalizations or cause those numbers to rise. It's a very interesting situation where the cases are going up, but it does not at this point in time appear to be any degree of severity. Dr. Fauci also saying the new variant may become the dominant strain in the U.S. Today, the CDC said it was the cause of nearly 35 percent of new COVID-19 infections in the past week, up from about 22 percent the week before. 
is still ahead. Students in San Antonio creating fashionable looks for a good cause. We have a look at the Fiesta inspired designs after the break. Fiesta fashion for a good cause. Fiesta kicks off next week. Can you believe it? I know I cannot. So leading up to the fun festivities, Stevens High School students are creating fashion designs to help Goodwill San Antonio. As Max Massey shows us, this fashion show will help Northside students and families all over our community. This class has helped me not only with like school wise, but it's also helped me like with my confidence in like whatever fashion has to do with. Jessica Ruiz is one of the Stevens High School students, not only working on her future in fashion, but also working to help out Goodwill San Antonio. We are celebrating our partnership with Stevens High School and the Entrepreneurship and Fashion Program with a Fiesta Sustainable Fashion Show. The rehearsals are complete, the students are ready, and the show is set. So we're going to have 20 students from Stevens High School who are going to be modeling looks that they've curated and created from gently used items that have been donated to Goodwill. So and after those show, those looks are going to be put up for sales immediately following. So folks can purchase those Fiesta looks, get ready for next week if you're interested in checking out the fiesta sustainable fashion show you can join in on the fun tomorrow evening at the goodwill on petranco 6 to 8 p.m 90 cents of every dollar spent at a goodwill san antonio store gets reinvested here in our local community now we know unemployment's been a, a big talk the last couple of years a lot of families going through a lot of hard times how has the goodwill helped out and how will this program help out well, sure. Again, from employment opportunities and workforce development programs, we are helping San Antonians who may have lost a job during the pandemic gain those employment opportunities or also gain skills that they may not have had otherwise as industries and just our employment landscape has changed over the years. As for students like Jessica and her classmates in the entrepreneurship and fashion program at Stevens, they are ready to show off their creations and help families across the Alamo City. Fashions never look so good. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. You know, out there today in the shade with the wind, a little bit of a chill in the air. Yeah. Not feeling like Fiesta, but I am not mad about that. It just felt like, like, clean. It yes. did. Like the city felt clean. We had that just baby blue sky. Yeah. You know, the really clean, crisp, blue, dry air in place, and that gusty northwesterly wind pushing in that dry lack of any humidity type of air. So northwesterly winds still at 20 miles per hour. Dew point of 32 degrees. Currently we're at 65 degrees for the air temperature. We're running below average. We'll be 53 at 11 p.m. tomorrow morning at the bus stop right near 40, but even cooler in some spots. We'll show you where and how cool in just a bit, along with some uh, photos from last night's storms locally. Coming right up. In the buzz, one of Andy Warhol's iconic Marilyn Monroe portraits could draw a record auction price for the 20th century artwork. Auctioneer Christie's expecting bids of around $200 million. The current auction record for a 20th century painting is a Pablo Picasso painting that went for $179.4 million in 2015. Warhol's 40 square inch shot sage blue Marilyn will go on sale in New York in May. It's one of dozens of images the artist made of Monroe back in the 1960s. Get ready for your daily dose of cute. This one comes to you courtesy the Denver Zoo. It has welcomed a rare and adorable addition to its herd, a baby bongo. The calf named Winston was born to parents Fern and Howard on March 5th. All right, the zoo gave animal lovers their first look at Winston last week in a video on Twitter. Bongo is a rare species of antelope found in rainforests from Senegal to Kenya. The Denver Zoo has four adult eastern bongos, which are even more rare than western bongos. Those ears. Little bongo trivia there for you. All right, you can customize your peeps for Easter this year. You choose the color, yellow, pink, or blue. Select a dip that sits on the bottom half of the chick. The dip choices are a dark milk or white chocolate. And finally, you choose a topping, a round confetti sprinkles, non peril sprinkles, crushed cookie, crushed pretzel, chocolate chips, 
or toasted coconut. Six personalized chicks in two boxes cost $29.95 plus shipping. They're available at peepsandcompany.com until supplies run out. Sparked a little peep debate. Not a lot of peep yeah. love. On the, uh, on the on the set right here now, in I know. The studio. I know mean, it's okay. I mean, I I don't I don't think they're horrible, but uh, no, thank you. I mean, you just why customize? We're just gonna put them in the microwave anyway and see them go. <laughs> that's what you. <laughs> that's right? what you've done with peeps over the. Yeah, years. that's what you do with them, right? I I, I thought you ate them, but I could be wrong. No, yeah. no, no, no. You have a little science fun with them. You Got know it. what? If we okay. get any, I'll I'll bring them to you. Yeah, I will not do. tell my four. Let's try that for Easter. Idea. Let's do it for Easter. Who can inflate the biggest peep in the microwave? I want you to do that. I'm not encouraging anybody Thursday. in case there are any issues of burned peeps. Can you? I don't know if you can really burn them. Okay, let's let's talk about what we had yesterday. Take a look at some photos here. This is from our KSAT Weather Authority app. The pins on the bottom part. A lot of folks uh, submitted photos. This was in San Antonio. This is just outside 410 in East Houston. That's a little bigger than quarter size hail. Then we had Kirby area. This was all late last night around midnight and even a little after. Converse, hail core moved through there. FM 78, Highlands Farms. And then one benefit, of course, was the rainfall. Look at that, just under two inches in Seguin. And on the back side of it in Campbellton, that was a nice photo. Of course, the rain came at a bit of a cost, as it does often this time of year in the springtime, which is severe weather season, but we did get some good accumulations, especially eastern Lavaca County. I mean, east of Hallettsville, we're talking nearly three inches in eastern Lavaca County. In Hallettsville, just over an inch, about an inch and a third. Molten area, about an inch. Shiner, 1.7. Of course, the real sweet spot for the rain was where we had the tornado just north of Seguin, King, Kingsbury, and then on across the San Marcos River into Caldwell County and right along I-10, two to three inches of rain estimated by the radar. At the International Airport, our official reporting site, we had just about a quarter of an inch from those showers. So here's the big picture. We cleared out still some mid clouds behind it that could scrape past us as we go through tomorrow. But overall, sunny and dry pattern. The active and severe weather has been Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and that's moving eastward. This is kind of a classic spring system where you have a little of everything from severe storms to heavy snow, stretching all the way from the Gulf Coast with the severe weather northward to closer to the Canadian border with the heavy snow over a foot in parts of northern Minnesota from this. Meanwhile, you're talking severe thunderstorms and tornadoes what we had yesterday in Texas and now moving eastward along the Gulf Coastline. This upper level low that's moving out of here, it's going to be replaced and will be under the influence of an upper level high. So this ridge that's moving into the West Coast, that's going to be influencing our weather, unfortunately. No chance of rain with that. I wish I had better news, but not even a sliver of a chance for the rest of this week and into early next week. The wind we've been dealing with still gusting to 35 miles per hour outside and the wind will be noticeable the next couple of days, but luckily at during the nights it's going to calm down a bit. So this evening the wind dropping down gusting to maybe 15 17 miles per hour by about midnight tonight. Temperature wise already 59 in Kerrville. We're 71 Pleasanton Hondo 68. 61 in Bulverde, but look at tomorrow morning. We're expecting 38 in Holotus, 39 in Bulverde, 43 in Floresville. So some upper 30s in outlying areas, especially in the hill country. And then the mornings this week remain cool, right near 40 degrees all the way through Friday. Afternoons, however, will be comfortable and sunny. So jackets in the mornings but by the afternoons, short sleeves. So you can dress in layers. That's basically uh, what we're the takeaway here from the forecast. So by tomorrow afternoon, right near 70 degrees, and then we get into the mid 80s by Friday, but still the cool mornings and mid 80s through the weekend. All right, thank you, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Good morning to you. It is Tuesday, March 22nd. A grand jury has indicted a Bear County Sheriff's deputy for shooting and killing a man inside a home in Elmendorf back in March of 2020. Deputy Brandon Moran is facing a felony charge of manslaughter for the death of 47-year-old Jesus Bonito Garcia. Before the sun even rose, the Lincoln courts were wide awake 
Police and people who live here met up in the middle, all trying to find out more about a shooting. Police say someone took aim at a 29-year-old man around 6 this morning and did not miss. He was hit repeatedly, both in his head and body. As Russia continues escalating its attack on Ukraine, Ukrainian forces keeping up the fight, desperately holding on to their country. Ukrainian authorities say their troops reclaimed a strategically important suburb of Kyiv, but other areas around the capital city are still under siege. A historic day as Supreme Court nominee Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson takes the hot seat at her confirmation hearing. Republican Senator John Corn raising concerns about Judge Jackson and her representation of Guantanamo Bay detainees. Homes and businesses seriously damaged in the city of Round Rock across the state. Many now sifting through what's left. Governor Greg Abbott declaring a disaster declaration today at a news conference in Jacksboro. That's one of the area's worst hit during the severe weather. First, <laughs> Fiesta Metal giveaway for me. That is tomorrow. As usual, line can start forming at 4 p.m. We give away the medals at 6. I'll be there live at 5 and 6 p.m. This is at the Children's Hospital of San Antonio Emergency Center in Stone Oak. That's on Santerra Boulevard. I'll see you there.